Um, and as Dave said, I've just returned from um, four weeks on the Queen Mary 2 going around the Caribbean doing stargazing. So uh, uh, that was a lot more pleasant and warmer than it is back here now in, in Britain. But anyway, um, the subject of tonight's uh, talk, Snowball Earth, was something that I came across uh, on a TV program a number of years ago, actually, and then later managed to find the book by uh, the main protagonist of this uh, very interesting theory about the history of uh, the Earth and the climate and the consequences for life on Earth. And it's a very interesting and, and tortuous story with lots of um, links to different bits of science. So there's some astronomy in here. There is some planetary science. Um, we'll talk about volcanoes and we'll talk about mainly the sort of history of the Earth. So let's, uh, without further ado, move on to the first slide, which is this one. This is a diagram of the history of the Earth split up into different time periods. Um, you can see that the modern times are right at the top, ancient times at the bottom. And then we've got some numbers going down the right hand side there, which are in millions of years, labeling the divisions between the uh, different periods. And they've all got names and you'll, some of them are familiar like Jurassic and Cretaceous. They're the age of the dinosaurs in that Mesozoic period. So starting with the Triassic 252 million years ago um, and moving up through time to the more recent times. 66 million years ago, of course, it went from the Cretaceous to the Paleocene, and that's a very famous date that corresponds to the disappearance of the dinosaurs, and they got wiped out in a uh, ferocious event, probably caused by the impact of a large asteroid on the Earth. But what I want to really uh, show you is that the periods of the uh, Earth are divided up and named according to the types of fossils that were being found in the rocks. So the way you work out where a or where which period a, a particular rock sample comes from is by looking at the fossils within it. And those were then grouped and named and the periods defined afterwards. So it's very much a sort of fossils first periods derived from them. And what you'll notice is that as we go down to the bottom of the screen, we get to 541 billion uh, million years ago. Um, and then suddenly we've just got two periods, the Protozoic and the Archean, uh, going all the way back to the formation of the Earth 4.6 billion years ago, with basically no fossils in the left-hand part of the diagram, and obviously a huge amount of time squeezed into those two uh, very early periods with basically, apparently, nothing happening. Um, very much because of this view that we weren't finding any fossils in any rocks of those periods, and therefore they're all just lumped together into this uh, sort of very ancient categories. But if we go right back to the formation of the Earth 4,600 million years ago, formed in, in orbit around the sun out of the cloud of leftover material that uh, went to form the sun and then the planets um, are gradually self-accreting under gravity, sticking together, forming larger planetoids, baby planets. Um, a number of violent collisions would have then gone on, leading to mergers. And we, of course, live on one of the surviving predators of this uh, very aggressive uh, period of planet building. Uh, the Earth has, was one of the four inner planets that managed to build up to a size to dominate its own orbit and uh, is still pulling in some leftover material today. It's about 100 tonnes a day of material falls to Earth in the form of uh, meteorites. But of course, the surface of the Earth would have been incredibly hot, um, 
covered in molten lava due to the energy of all of those impacts. The uh, rate of impacts has died down now to almost nothing. But in the early days, it would have been a more or less continuous rain of material falling in out of the sky, dumping all of its kinetic energy um, and leading to tremendous heat. Plus, back then, 4,600 million years ago, the solar system was a much, much more radioactive place than it is now. The uh, half-lives of a lot of the radioactive elements that were present in the original solar nebula are much, much shorter than these periods. So you have aluminium-26 with a half-life of 700,000 years. So in that first few million years, it was probably very, very radioactive indeed, uh, but has all, almost all decayed away now. You have uh, potassium-40 with a one and a quarter billion year half-life. That's still making your bananas that you have for breakfast mildly radioactive to this day. Uh, they have a lot of potassium in them. Um, and of course, the slower the release, the longer the half-life, the more slowly all that energy is released. So it's the short half-life, highly radioactive elements were contributing a huge amount to the heating of the, the planet in the first place. So you can imagine the early Earth during that time being pretty much a ball of molten lava caused by all of this heat. And it eventually had to dissipate that heat to space, dump it out, radiate it away, get rid of it in order to cool down and form a, a solid surface or indeed a surface that could be then covered in water delivered probably by infalling cometary material, dumping a mixture of dirt and ice onto the surface and building up uh, the oceans. And so at the end of the Hadean period, 4,000 million years ago, things had probably calmed down enough. And we went into what is then called the pre-Cambrian era. Perhaps the best date for this is 3,800 million years ago, to 600 million years ago. That's a huge slice of time. It's actually 70% of the Earth's history all lumped into this pre-Cambrian era. And that corresponds to that apparently fossilless, lifeless era of the Earth. And it was originally thought to be lifeless because there were no fossils to be found. Of course, we now look with more sensitive instruments uh, very powerful microscopes and electron microscopes. And so we are able to find the fossilized remains of microorganisms right through this Precambrian era. And the latest date for uh, the signs of the earliest forms of life do indeed go all the way back to 3,800 million years ago. So not long after the Earth acquired liquid water on the surface on a cool enough surface for any reasonable uh, environment to exist, life managed to establish itself. That in itself is, is quite amazing and quite shocking that life can grow out of apparently nothing quite so quickly. Uh, some people, of course, say it might have been seeded from elsewhere, and that remains a possibility. But um, if we then look at what happened, what the state of life just after the end of this period, after the, we reached 600 million years ago. So the Cambrian at 545 million years ago, suddenly the oceans looked more like this. We had all of these marvelous creatures swimming around in the oceans. You've got this guy at the top. I'll try and use my mouse pointer here. This is Inomina Caris with its eyes on stalks and these amazing claws uh, and fins could clearly see and swim around. Scuttling about on the ocean floor, you had the, uh, the very first form of the trilobites. Trilobites were one of the uh, types of creatures that have dominated the earth for 250 million years or so, actually, um, until they suffered a catastrophic event later on. Um, and we still have the, the very distant descendants of them scuttling about now, 
in the form of wood lice. Uh, but all of these other jellyfish and other creatures in the sea, very rich and diverse environment. And so something changed and changed very dramatically, very quickly between 600 million years ago and 545 million years ago. So we went from having basically a slime world consisting of uh, single celled bacteria and uh, single celled algae like um, organisms to all of this diverse life in the twinkle of an eye. It's quite incredible. Now, nowadays, we have better methods of dating things, dating rocks, than just looking for fossils and uh, lumping them into categories. And this really all relates to that same radioactivity idea and the idea of a half-life. The random decay of individual atoms means that over time, after a, uh, a given time, half the original will be left. Um, and a, what will happen is you'll see in this chart on the right hand side of the screen that the blue line starts at uh, the 100 percent of the parent isotope and uh, over time it, that decays down exponentially and you see the corresponding rise in the proportion of the decay product the daughter isotope where one element is turned into another dumping some uh, energy and losing some mass in the process and so if you have a, a rock that's formed they're normally formed of crystals of course and the crystals uh, precipitate out of whatever the liquid is in a very precise way capturing a very uh, much individual combination of elements so they will be formed with all of the uh, parent isotope uh, but then once they've solidified and locked in that chemical composition, then over time, there are any radioactive elements decay. And so we can then look at them and work out how long it has been since the crystal formed. Now, that only works for crystals. It only works for dating things to the point of last crystallization. But uh, if you're careful about your analysis, you can use that to date the rocks um, independently of the fossil content. And if, if we go back then to that three billion year period of slime world, as some people call it, we find now that we can subdivide it up into uh, some more interesting categories. To begin with, there were simple bacteria like uh, creatures, which are just little uh, cell membranes containing some DNA or some RNA, and they go about their business reproducing, producing identical copies of themselves or near identical copies, gradually mutating, of course. Um, and then two billion years ago, one of those mutations led to the uh, invention, I suppose the word is, of photosynthesis, the trapping of light, and the ability of, to use light to provide the energy for life instead of chemistry. Prior to that, everything was living off the minerals and the heat in the likes of hot springs and so forth, where there was a chemical imbalance. They were probably living on and feeding on iron and sulfur and uh, carrying out chemical reactions involving those. But photosynthesis changed everything. It uh, led to a byproduct in the form of oxygen being dumped into the atmosphere. We'll hear more about that later. Um, and that actually turned out to be quite poisonous to quite a lot of uh, strains of organisms. So there was a great dying, a loss of quite a substantial proportion of the very earliest creatures were basically chemically poisoned by the byproduct of photosynthesis. Um, and if they were unable to cope with it, they died unless they managed to find a, a niche environment where they were protected from it. And that was around two billion years ago. One billion years ago, something else happened, which was complicated cells emerged, so-called eukaryotes. And these are where 
a cell would absorb other smaller cells and capture them so that it formed a, a compound cell. And in particular, all animal cells are derived from these complex uh, cells where they first captured uh, little energy manufacturing bacteria, which we now have in our cells called mitochondria. And the plants, the, the higher plants, are also these complex cells where they captured, in addition, some algae into themselves. And those are now the chloroplasts, which are like cells within a cell. So you have these complex uh, creatures still with one master cell, but containing a number of smaller uh, elements within it. And the next step that perhaps was the, the vital one to produce complex life was the uh, getting together of more than one cell into a multicellular creature where the cells didn't all do the same job, but they formed a, an organism where different uh, parts of the organism carried out different functions. And of course, that's led to the huge diversity of life, such as us. Um, all the way down the line. But that was just around about the very end of the slime world period. Now, the world wasn't a static place, of course. Um, uh, it was in constant motion. And the idea that the continents on the surface of the Earth might move around was first uh, put forward by uh, Antonio Snyder Pellegrini in 1858. He spotted something that I spotted when I was a kid, which was when you looked at the uh, picture of the globe uh, that showed on the BBC, for example, um, on TV, the uh, shape of Africa and the shape of uh, the Americas seemed to fit together extraordinarily well, as if you could push them together and uh, make them fit. And he spotted that. And did a little bit more than just wonder if it was true. He then went and studied the rocks in Africa and the rocks in South America. And you get the different layers of rocks stacked one on top of another as the different periods of climate uh, evolve. So you'll get sedimentary rocks in different layers laid down one after another. And it's like a, like a fingerprint. And he found that the fingerprint matches for the rocks of the similar ages at the two sides of the Atlantic, suggesting that they were formed as uh, one entity when the Atlantic Ocean basically didn't exist. And South America and North America were rammed hard up against Africa. So that led to the idea of the fact that the continents could move around and the oceans could grow and shrink so-called continental drift. Another fancy word for it is plate tectonics, because we now realize that the surface of the Earth is like a cracked eggshell. It's got all of these uh, large plates that are marked out by the uh, black lines here. And it is these plates moving around and growing and shrinking, carrying the continents around with them that are at work in all of that. One thing that plate tectonics causes is the ring of fire, the volcanoes. There was uh, one very recently blew up in Tonga. That was part of the ring of fire around the edge of the Pacific plate about here. But it goes all the way around through Japan and down the uh, western side of the Americas. And what's happening is that this is where the Pacific Ocean is shrinking as North America and Asia are moving towards each other. Um, and the Pacific Ocean crust is being dragged down underneath the continents. The continents tend to be made of lighter, less dense material, partly because the ocean crust, well, it's covered in a layer of water and the water gets into every molecular nook and cranny increasing the overall density. And so the ocean crust tends to lose the argument when the two butt up against each other and takes a dive down into the core of the earth where it melts um, and then releases all of its water content uh, back as superheated steam 
that creates the ash volcanoes that we see along the ridges along the continent margins. The corresponding process at the middle of the Atlantic is uh, mid-ocean spreading where hot plumes of material from the inner core of the earth are rising up and forcing the two plates aside, building more ocean plates. So the Atlantic is getting bigger and uh, hence driving South America and Africa apart. And that's been going on for some hundreds of millions of years now. Uh, and correspondingly, of course, something has to give and it's the Pacific Ocean, which is shrinking. So I just wanted to explain a bit about the fact that the, the continents are always moving around because it will become a key part of the, the story. But let's get back into the meat of things. And one of the first observations that uh, led to the whole subject that we're talking about was the behavior of uh, boulders that land on glaciers. So here's a picture of a glacier that I took on a mission up to Spitsbergen at 80 degrees north a couple of years ago. Um, and you can see the glacier advancing and then melting into the fjord. Uh, but it's very dirty. There's a lot of dirty, dusty material on top of the glacier, including some quite large rocks. And those rocks have fallen onto the glacier from the mountain sides of the valleys in which the glacier is uh, moving and they get carried down the valley on top of the glacier and out to sea until the glacier melts and then they are dropped uh, they obviously sink through the water and land in the sediment there's an awful lot of dirt and fine sediment dropped by the the glacier um, and you see that in these layers in the picture on the right hand side with these occasional large boulders dumped in it. Um, and this is very characteristic of the fact that you've had a glacier. If you see these drop stones in these layers, then at that time, the, uh, that was the tail end of a glacier. And so it was a huge surprise to Paul Hoffman, the, the real hero of this story, when he was exploring in the Namibian desert and he found this. What you have here is a drop stone, quite a large one, we've got a, a coin for scale here, that has fallen in and sunk into the sediment layers um, of what must have been an ancient glacier. Um, and he looked and he worked out that these rocks dated back to 600 million years ago which was interesting, but of no great consequence to him immediately. But what was really surprising was that this was in uh, Southwest Africa, Namibia, a hot desert country today. Um, and, but it's a clear sign that there were glaciers uh, in, in operation in that region 600 million years ago. When he looked above and below the drop stones though, he realized that the um, layers above and below were of a type of rock called cap carbonates that are only formed in warm waters. The sort of thing that we often see talked about when we're talking about Mars and the search for water there. Um, we find carbonates and we tend to think this must have been um, a lake. Uh, absolutely right. Uh, but it must have been a warm lake. Uh, carbonates only form in warm water. And so what this suggests is that Namibia, as, a, as part of the African continent, must have moved to a polar region, had some glaciers leading to the drop stones, and then moved back again to be in warmer regions quite quickly, because there wasn't very many layers between the above and below warm climate features, and then this sudden cold snap. Um, and it seemed somewhat uh, unfeasible for Namibia to have done that so quickly. The continents do move around, but they don't rush to the pole and then rush straight back again quite like that. It seemed uh, rather odd. And so he looked into working out if there were methods of working out where 
on Earth, the rocks were laid down. Could we work a, uh, find a method for discovering where on Earth they were when they were created? And the solution to that is that when rocks are laid down, they capture the Earth's magnetic field. They fossilize the magnetic field into them, particularly the uh, horizontal component of the field. And I show that with this bar diagram here with the bar magnet through the Earth. Look at the field lines and near the equator, the field lines point horizontally. Near the poles, the field lines come into the surface nearly vertically. And so if you can measure the direction of this dip angle that's in fossilized into the rock, you can come up with a, a good piece of evidence for what the latitude was at which the rock was formed when it fossilized and trapped the magnetic field. And so Paul did that for these rocks, these 600 million year old rocks around the drop stones and found to his surprise that it told him that Namibia was at the equator 600 million years ago, not at the pole. And this doesn't make any sense at all because how could uh, a contour, a piece of continent that was at the equator have a glacier on it uh, they're just uh, just crazy talk so he uh, very much puzzled by this if we go back to Svalbard up there at 80 degrees north uh, here's a, another photograph that I took and we've got some red boulder clays along the edge of the fjord here and those are indicative of ice on the move well, no surprise there, we're 80 degrees north, of course we're going to have glaciers. But again, Svalbard has moved. And these boulder clays were laid down 600 million years ago. You can see there's many, many layers on top of them since that have been laid down in that uh, picture. And 600 million years ago, Svalbard was in the tropics. And so we had ice at the tropics and further evidence for it. And in fact, the more Paul uh, Hoffman looked, the more he found drop stones in these uh, glacial deposits all over the, uh, the world, all dating from this same time period. Now that's very interesting because you can't have all the continents at the pole at the same time. There just isn't room. There's only room to park one continent at each pole at any given moment. So how could it be that wherever he looked, he found uh, evidence of glaciation 600 million years ago? The only explanation is a global ice age, a snowball earth, where the whole of the earth is covered in ice right there from the poles to the equator. And this fitted with a theory that had been brought forward by uh, computer-based climate modelers uh, at about this time. What the climate modelers had discovered was that if you tried to put ice uh, glaciation into your models, there was a a runaway effect that could occur. Gradually, as you added ice at the poles, you found that the ice reflects more heat out into space, increasing the uh, uh, albedo of the Earth, rejecting more of the sun's heat and cooling the whole of the planet. But of course, cooling the planet leads to more ice formation and the uh, glaciers grow outwards from the poles but then they lead to, that leads to more cooling. And so you get a runaway effect. And once the uh, ice reached the tropical latitudes very rapidly, it would spiral out of control and lock the whole planet into a full snowball, 100% glaciation or very nearly that. Furthermore, the climate should then get locked into this state because as the temperature drops, well below the uh, freezing point of water, 
all the water vapor in the atmosphere would be sucked down onto the surface to form yet more ice. And that dries the atmosphere. A water vapor in the atmosphere is a very powerful greenhouse gas. It's responsible for actually keeping us at a sensible temperature along with carbon dioxide um, today. But if you remove all the water vapor, you will get a huge reduction in the greenhouse effect um, and a dry atmosphere will cool the planet even further, locking the planet into this frozen snowball state. So the climate modelers thought, well, this can't be right because we would get completely trapped in this uh, sort of snowball situation. How would we ever get out of it again? Well, the answer is volcanoes. Those volcanic processes that uh, we've talked a little bit about continue. The heat is still trying to rise out of the center of the Earth where it uh, got trapped during the Hadean era when the, the Earth formed, plus additional radioactive energy being released, adding to that. And so volcanoes carry on erupting. And when they erupt, they put uh, superheated steam uh, and carbon dioxide and sulfur dioxide and other gases up into the atmosphere. And so gradually, if you have your completely covered snowball, the volcanoes will punch up through it and pour more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And it's that which gradually rescues the situation. Under normal conditions, this is the carbon dioxide cycle. It's a very nice diagram of it. So we start at the top, we have um, carbon dioxide in the air, dissolves in water in clouds, forming a weak acid, um, carbonic acid. That reacts with the uh, material in the rocks, particularly things like calcium silicate, um, and dissolves the calcium into the water runs down in rivers into the ocean, um, and there in the oceans, the calcium carbonate and other materials get uh, deposited onto the, the sea floor, onto the, um, the floor of the oceans. So the oceans end up with their um, a high concentration of these carbonates. But we already know that the ocean plates are eventually doomed to subduct and be drawn down underneath the adjacent continent uh, and be destroyed and melted. And when that happens, the carbon dioxide is again released to rise back via the volcanoes and go round again. So this cyclic process uh, means that the carbon dioxide cycles around going once around this loop about every 200 million years for each atom because that's how how long the uh, the deposits on the ocean plates and the ocean floor tend to last about 200 million years um, and that's all well and good but you can stop this if you put ice all over the uh, land you block the ability of carbon dioxide to react with rock. You can't get at it anymore. There's a layer of ice in the way. And so carbon dioxide is not removed from the atmosphere and not deposited onto the seafloor, but and just builds up and up and up in the uh, upper atmosphere. Of course, that leads to a warming and is the process by which the green, uh, snowball it manages to escape. But just a word also about these formations, a little bit more geology for you. The ancient oceans, way back before life had invented photosynthesis, contain vast amounts of iron. There's a lot of iron in the Earth. The whole of the um, Earth's core is made of iron um, and other metals. But uh, a lot of it comes up through vents in the seafloor into the oceans, and you end up with a lot of dissolved iron in the early uh, oceans. And that's all well and good, 
in a reducing environment without oxygen present. But when life invented photosynthesis and started putting free oxygen about into the atmosphere, that would oxidize the iron two salts that were dissolved in the oceans, making the oceans very green in color, presumably. It would change them from iron in its number two oxidation state to iron in its number three oxidation state, or rust as we call it, and it would, uh, all of the iron three salts tend to be insoluble, and so they deposit out, and we get these bands of uh, iron, these banded iron formations, many meters thick, where the ocean was dumping all of its iron because of the oxidizing atmosphere that had emerged. And so these banded iron formations date back to around that period, um, around about 1.8 billion years ago, uh, and are found all over the, uh, the ocean floors of that time. But curiously, in Canada, in the same 600 million year old rocks where the drop stones were found, they found more banded iron. And these two sets of deposits are pretty much the only two. The, the 1.8 billion year old banded irons from the photosynthesis event and these from 600 million years ago. And this tells us that somehow iron must have reaccumulated in the ocean and then been redumped. And that is another clue to putting all of the pieces together because underneath that snowball uh, covering, the deep sea vents were continually releasing iron from deep in the core of the earth. And so the iron would have built up in the sea again, but it's now protected from being able to react with the oxygen in the atmosphere by the thick layer of ice of the snowball. And so what happened was the iron built up and built up um, until the volcanoes had managed to release enough carbon dioxide. In fact, a thousand times the current level of carbon dioxide was where it got to, in order to create enough warming to uh, start to melt the ice. And once the first cracks then began to form in the uh, ice, making the oceans be able to contact through to the atmosphere, letting the oxygen get at the iron again, then you got that secondary round of the banded iron formations being deposited. So this all sort of fits together as part of the story. Now, once the um, ice started to melt, it turns into a runaway process the other way. Um, all of, when there's less ice, there is less, reflectivity of the heat so there's less cooling and so the uh, all of the ice melts very rapidly away but now you've got a thousand times the amount of uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that you uh, had before and you've also got all that water vapor back and so temperatures go from minus 40 in the snowball very rapidly to plus 40 degrees and you get a runaway greenhouse effect, um, heating the earth and uh, making a thoroughly unpleasant uh, desert out of large swathes of it. But eventually, uh, the uh, carbon dioxide then has access to the rock and is able to be weathered out and deposited back into the deep oceans. And so carbon dioxide reduces again, and then you bring the temperatures back down and the earth returns to some sort of normal after this absolutely enormous and catastrophic uh, swing from deep freeze to, to superheated and back again in a fairly short period of time, geologically speaking. So that's, that's great. That's pretty much the picture of what happened. The question really is, why did it happen? And why particularly would it happen then? And is it going to do it again? 
So the question, what triggered the snowball? Well, we can bring a bit of astronomy into things here because the Earth's orbit around the sun is partly responsible for all of this. We orbit the sun 150 kilo million kilometers away from it, roughly, in an ellipse. But the shape of that ellipse gradually changes in cycles. The eccentricity of it, the degree to which it's elliptical rather than circular, fluctuates backwards and forwards with a period of 100,000 years. The tilt of the plane of the uh, orbit compared to the plane of Jupiter's orbit wobbles backwards and forwards in 41,000 years. And we have two different periods by which the tilt and the direction of the Earth's spin axis change 26,000 and 21,000 years. These are the Milankovitch cycles. And if you model these and work out how much heat you are going to receive, particularly at the North Pole, um, then here's 65 North, so the Arctic Circle, modeled over hundreds of thousands of years, taking into account the uh, Milankovitch cycles, in terms of the power, the sun's heat energy hitting each square meter of the ground. So on average, it's about 500 watts per square meter. Um, and indeed, that's about the, uh, the, the power that you get out of a good solar panel, you know, um, modulated by its efficiency. So, but you can see that the Milankovitch cycles cause it to wobble up and down with the combination of all of those different periods creating this relatively crazy waveform. And that just at the moment, now we're, well, a little below the middle, but not too far below it. Um, and you can see it, it's changing from, what, 430 to 550. So that's um, a swing of about 100 or 20 percent, which is quite a big uh, change in the, the amount of heat that each square meter is receiving. So the question is, what then happens to that heat? And here is a map of where the continents were 750 million years ago, just before all of this kicked off. And you can see that most of the continents are in relatively tropical waters, certainly quite a lot of them at the equator, and nobody at the poles. And that matters because when that sunlight that's coming in from uh, space hits the, uh, the Earth, obviously it's most efficiently absorbed at the equator where it's coming in uh, at a nice 90 degree angle. And at the poles, you've got a low incidence of, uh, low angle of incidence. And so it's spread over a much larger area. So you, the uh, effect is weaker. But if we have ice at the poles, then we are going to reflect that light and heat back into space. And when you put all of this together, you get a very interesting balance. If you have land at the poles, then the land can become ice covered. That ice will reflect heat back into space, but it also prevents that piece of land absorbing carbon dioxide by the rock weathering process. And so you're reflecting more heat into space because you've got more ice, but you are increasing greenhouse warming by not taking CO2 out of the atmosphere, letting the volcanoes continue to churn more of it in and build CO2 up. And so the CO2 effect is counterbalancing the effect of the greater reflectivity. So this is a negative feedback effect of the, the carbon dioxide. And so things are relatively stable. But if you have your land all at the equator, then 
it reflects more heat to space. Land is better at heat, reflecting heat to space than uh, ocean is. Ocean is the best absorber. Even if it's not covered in ice, that's true. And so the land at the equator very much points to a colder climate. But because it's not covered in ice yet, it leads to uh, no reduction in the, the weathering process. And so the ice at the poles can continue to advance and reflect more heat. And the ice is reflecting it from uh, over the top of the ocean, of course, there, make, making quite a big difference to the amount that's reflected. And so here you've got more of a positive feedback scenario leading to a runaway snowball. And remember, the climate modelers tell us that once the ice reaches the tropics, it will run away to uh, a complete lock in, regardless of uh, the fact that you get a, a bit of a slowdown as the uh, equatorial land gets covered in ice and stops weathering CO2 out. It's kind of too late by then and it, the, the ice shell snaps shut. And so that disposition of the continents that we had was a crucial factor. And if we look at the position of the continents over uh, the entire period, 825 million years ago, the supercontinent Rodina formed. All the continents got together in one enormous landmass in polar regions. Land at the pole, negative feedback, stable. But then they started moving south. And 750 million years ago, Rodina crossed the equator. Land at the equator, uh, positive feedback, potential runaway. And combined with the right phase of the Milankovitch cycles, that was enough to trigger a runaway and a snowball to form. But the continents continued on southwards and started to break up. And as they reached the uh, polar regions, there was no longer very much land at the equator. And so round about the period between 600 and 530 million years ago, the snowball was able to be unlocked by that buildup of CO2. So that's how it uh, escaped. Now, it turns out this is not the only snowball event. There was a previous one way back, even before the banded iron formations and before photosynthesis had been invented. The same thing happened with another supercontinent, this time not including India, which was up at the pole, but all of the rest of the land got together at the equator. Um, and that was enough to cause an earlier snowball event way, way back in the uh, very early Precambrian. And again, we found drop stones overlaid by cap carbonates, all of the signatures of um, the same processes happening from rocks of this period. But it all begs the question, how come we're here to look at the evidence? Because if the earth got completely covered in ice, um, that doesn't going to bode well for survival of life on earth. So it must have been the case that somehow there were small pockets of the slime world uh, occupants of the earth, the bacteria and the simple algae, and even the slightly more complicated um, eukaryotic uh, creatures and the very first multicellular creatures perhaps, managed to eke out an existence trapped in warmer pockets where the sea ice perhaps wasn't quite so thick and they just about managed to survive it but the vast majority would have died. Of course, another place where life could continue to hang out was near hot springs. These would have been the exceptions to the rule if there's uh, water coming out of the ground at uh, 200 degrees centigrade caused by uh, geothermal activity, it'll soon displace the ice. And uh, then all sorts of interesting uh, life can exist within these hot springs uh, we get extremophile bacteria that do all sorts of strange chemistry to live. 
um, in these sorts of environments uh, very well worth further study. And deep on the floor of the oceans, well, the black smokers would have continued doing their work, producing nutrients just like they had been since the dawn of the earth, completely oblivious to the fact that there was a snowball earth going on above them and keeping these little regions habitable as well. So we can kind of rationalize the fact that we're here and that life would have survived these, these events. Um, and what then happened was once the snowball went away, and of course it went quite quickly, the, the runaway de-snowballing event occurred um, and the climate then restabilized. And it let very much left a blank canvas. There was not very much life around. And that is a trigger, and it has always been a trigger repeatedly for a huge burst of rapid evolution. Suddenly, there's a whole ecosystem that's not got any occupants because they've all been killed by a mass extinction. And suddenly, we were just in the right situation where we had multicellular creatures just beginning to evolve, perfectly uh, placed to rapidly colonize all of the, the earth that had previously been denied to them because it was full of slime. And so that great clearing of the ways occurred and it was really mass extinction number zero here on the chart was the, uh, the great ending of the snowball event that led to this huge rise in the number of uh, species that there were on earth during the Cambrian period and that great diversity. Uh, this chart also then shows other uh, great dying events. The number five here, this is the death of the dinosaurs 66 million years ago at the end of the Cretaceous period. But that was a relatively small event on uh, the scale of things. Number three here was the great dying at the end of the Permian, uh, where another catastrophic event pretty much uh, wiped out half of uh, the species on Earth or more. But each time life recovers quickly, you see, and it is these punctuated periods of mass extinction that accelerates evolution to rush back into the new void where the habitat's been created. And so it turns out actually this snowball event may well have been uh, a key factor in the development of life on Earth that really provided the impetus for us to break out of slime world where we'd been for three billion years and suddenly uh, have all of the complexity of life flowering across the whole planet. But to bring some astronomy back in, this is where we are now, uh, nicely in the habitable zone of our G-type star, not too hot, not too cold, just right. Um, and it's all good. But it's not going to stay that way. And you probably know that the sun will turn into a red giant. And we tell people that in 4,000 million years or so, uh, it will swell up and swallow the earth. Um, and that will be a very bad day. But actually, it's a much more gradual process than you might think. And it started already because right from the very first time when the sun switched on as a star and started carrying out nuclear fusion, it's been evolving, converting hydrogen to helium, gradually increasing the percentage of helium in the core. And every day as that percentage increases, the balance of forces between the mass of the sun, creating gravity to squeeze it, and the release of energy has to change as the core of the star gradually becomes more and more polluted with the helium, uh, it becomes less and less efficient. And so the star has to change its, uh, its balance of forces. This causes the uh, zone that's carrying out fusion to slightly expand inside the, the center to bring in more hydrogen and it forces the outer layers to expand slightly. Um, 
And as they expand, they have a greater surface area, but the temperature stays about the same to begin with, at least. And the star stays pretty much the same color as a result. But the larger surface area means the total heat output is greater. And so the Earth receives more and more heat if you put all of those together. So the uh, temperature of the sun is shown in green here from just after it formed, gradually increasing, but at a very slow rate. But its radius is increasing faster. And the product of those two is the overall luminosity, the power output. And that has increased uh, by about 30% since it was first formed. So the Earth is gradually subjected to more and more of the uh, amount of heat uh, every second compared to where it was. And if you look back, 600 million years ago would have been about here on the diagram. And it would, there would have been a lot less heat from the sun. So a snowball would have been relatively easy to induce. Um, and even way back 2.4 billion years ago for the, the first snowball event, even easier for it to happen. It's very likely now that there will be no more snowball events. And that's perhaps good news because uh, the planet is going to get warmer as the heat from the sun gradually increases. And as you can see, it increases exponentially rapidly and the size then also increases even more steeply. And so this phase here in 4,000 million years time, this is when the sun becomes a red giant in its final stages, but it's going to get a lot hotter on planet earth just in the next billion years or so. So we don't actually have 4,000 million years to, of uh, being able to sit on Earth and do nothing. We're going to have to worry about this um, a lot earlier than you might have thought. Of course, we can jump ship and move to Mars because as the sun gets hotter, Mars will get warmed back up again. Um, so perhaps in the, the 500 million years time, Mars will be in the habitable zone and the Earth will look more like Venus. And as time goes on, that habitable zone will move outwards and sweep across the solar system. Um, and our great descendants will be looking for new homes further out, perhaps in the asteroid belt or perhaps the moons of Jupiter. So perhaps we'll uh, find that Ceres becomes habitable or Europa or Ganymede, the moons of Jupiter here. Perhaps even Titan is uh, the, a place where mankind may have to try and move as that gets warmed up uh, by the ever increasing power output of the sun. Or Enceladus, another of the snowball worlds of the, Earth, of the solar system. This is a snowball in waiting. It has suffered a runaway snowball event. There's an ocean underneath. There are probably black smokers underneath keeping the uh, um, minerals and so forth pouring into that ocean. It wouldn't surprise me at all if there isn't primitive slime world-like life living uh, in the oceans of Enceladus right now, or even more complicated creatures just waiting really for the, uh, the ice to uh, go away. And even these two moons of Saturn, Rhea and Dione, they're snowball worlds as well, potentially with uh, liquid oceans under an ice crust right now. Uh, and there are more and more of these. The more you look, the more you find the moons of Uranus, Oberon and Ariel, both have uh, indications of the fact that they may well have some sort of liquid zone beneath. And in extremis, of course, we could go right to the edge of the solar system and look at Triton, uh, the moon of Neptune and Pluto, very similar object. Um, and these are fascinating in their own rights. Both may have uh, some sort of warm interior because they look to be geologically active. You've got the uh, great uh, liquid nitrogen geysers of Triton here and the enormous glacier that seems to be on the move across the surface of Pluto 
must be being driven by some sort of heat driven process from a warm interior, both of these. So it's very interesting. And who knows, they may well have uh, something going on underneath the surface that we don't yet know about. But just a final word is, of course, that all of these black smokers that I've talked about at the bottoms of the ocean are probably where uh, life on Earth first came into existence. And so you can put a picture together that life was formed by the black smokers. It may well have been saved by this geothermal activity from uh, a period as a snowball. Um, and then the volcanic processes broke us out of it. Um, and maybe the rest of those moons and asteroids that I've, uh, and dwarf planets that I, I've listed there are all currently locked in snowball worlds, waiting for the uh, increase in temperature for, of the sun to unlock them. And it wouldn't surprise me at all if they don't all have some sort of biological activity based around black smokers in their core uh, regions. And so with that, I probably should uh, bring this to an end. I've been talking for nearly an hour. And thank you very much. I hope you found that as fascinating as I did when I researched the, the subject um, and read Paul Hoffman's book, which is entitled Snowball Earth, making it very easy to go and buy your own copy on Amazon. Um, and no, it's not my book, it's his. I'm not plugging my own book here at all, but it is a really good read. So thank you very much for listening and I'll hand back to Mr. Eagle. Marvellous. Thank you very much, Paul. Absolutely fascinating to uh, hear about the uh, snowball earth. So something I've, I've not really um, been aware of all these years. So uh, yeah. Absolutely amazing. Now, one of the things with the changing of the Earth, Earth's orbit, and Phil put into the uh, chat as well, could that be, you know, a lot of people that don't believe in climate change that's happening because of our activities, do they use that and possible variability of the sun as well to explain what's happening on Earth? Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, the, the climate change deniers um look back and cherry pick the facts to suit their own arguments um what they do is they look back at uh, the historical record of the level of carbon dioxide for example and go yeah but look it was much greater in the past therefore it's not a problem but what they're doing is saying well 600 million years ago there was a thousand times more carbon dioxide so what are you worrying about we don't need to worry about doubling it or quadrupling it. Um, but they're forgetting that the sun was only producing 80% of the power at that point. And so we didn't fry because the sun was colder. Um, and you have to look at all of these pieces together, really, to get a proper understanding of it, yeah. not just pick the, the, the few facts that, that fit the case. And I think this story is a very good one for teaching to our children because it teaches them that the climate of the earth is really complicated and potentially unstable. Um, and that we don't really want to tinker with it. And the fact that the sun is, is getting hotter all the time means that we now need to worry more about the hot runaway than the cold runaway. Anybody got any questions for Paul? So you can unmute yourselves now. So if you have one, just fire away. I've got a question. Um, I, <clears throat> it's about um, why does the magnetic field um, change polarity? It, you get um, you didn't say that, but I know it does <laughs> from from my uh, student days, if you like. You're, you're absolutely right. It's uh... Is that it something. It does indeed flip backwards and forwards. And in terms of that sort of using it to date things, um, that's a little bit of a confusing factor. Uh, but the dating method relies not on which direction the field is pointing, north or south, but on the dip angle. Yeah. 
Um, and so from purposes of my argument, I don't need to worry about whether it was uh, 30 degrees north or 30 degrees south. The fact that it was 30 degrees is what I'm interested in, in terms of locating where the continents were. So fortunately, I can ignore the magnetic reversals, except for the fact that there are periods when during the uh, interreversal stage, the magnetic field drops to near zero, which doesn't help you very much. Um, but what causes it uh, is the, the sort of popular explanation is that um, the dynamo effect of the Earth creates the magnetic field. So it's a combination of the Earth rotating and the liquid outer core uh, with plumes of heat rising in it and a combination of them trying to rise up from the hot inner core towards the surface whilst the planet is spinning causes a Coriolis effect, the same twisting force that creates hurricanes in the atmosphere um, in this rising plume. And because that plume is liquid metal, um, uh, you get um, electric currents set up, which create the magnetic field. And that's the sort of dynamo method mechanism that creates the, the field in the first place. Why it then switches over, I have never seen a satisfactory explanation for, but it does. Um, and we're due another one. And people are a bit worried about it because the field over the South Atlantic is falling at the moment. And that seems to be a clue that a reversal is coming. But it could, it could be every 110,000 years or thereabouts, you know, so it's not something that's going to happen overnight. When was the last one? Uh, about 100,000 years ago. So we've got between zero and 10,000 years. What effect will that have if it does happen? It'd be very, very bad um, during the period when you have no magnetic field um, because the atmosphere will be exposed to the full force of the solar wind during that time. So you tend to lose the ozone layer that gets stripped away um, and a lot of other photochemical effects in, in the atmosphere. So the, the periods between are, are potentially quite bad from a sort of climate point of view um, until it recovers again once the, the the shields go back up you know it's like the shields on a starship enterprise you should never ever turn them off uh, so long is that recovery period. can i just say one thing about that of course the um north magnetic pole is moving quite fast suddenly as well isn't it it is i noticed that when i was doing another lecture i was talking about the northern lights and you used to have to correct uh, in the in the UK, you used to have to correct for the um, uh, magnetic offset when I learned to map read. There was eight degrees between true north and magnetic north. And the uh, Army Cadet Force taught me grid to mag, add, mag to grid, get rid. But now the magnetic deviation is naught. Um, so the, they're almost lined up from the UK's point of view. That's a terrific amount of movement in 40 years. And that too points towards uh, a potential reversal situation. But we don't understand it well enough to really be sure. Where I am, I've actually just moved into the Eastern Magnetic Hemisphere. I'm just south of London. I think the borders, the zero line has just gone past me towards the West. Yeah. And like I say, I was talking to my son about it. He was in the cadet force and he, he didn't know what I was talking about because they hadn't taught them that magnetic north might not be the same as grid north for the, for map reading. And I'm going, what? And then I discovered that it had uh, largely gone away. But if it's already crossed uh, where I am in Cambridge, we must therefore be uh, on, the, on the eastern half as well. Well, there was a big update to all the mobile phones, wasn't there, a little while ago, when the, they redid the world's magnetic model because of this? And it all got held up because of one of the American budget fiascos. 
<laughs> and for some while, the mobile phones were all off by a degree or so because they use magnetic sensors. Yeah, they do. They all have magnetometers in them these days. Um, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Something in the back of my mind, don't they have to go when the magnetic direction changes? They have to change all the numbers on runways around the world because it's in a different orientation. Yeah, it's only by 10 degrees, though, Dave. It's yeah, in 10 I, don't know. I don't know. I just remember hearing something. I thought, well, that's interesting. Yeah, they're in 10 degree steps. I think they did Heathrow about 10 or 15 years ago. OK. They all changed by one number. So two right. sixes now, two seven, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, the other question, I, I hope I'm not hogging this, I was going to ask is, has the area of ocean to land always remained constant? Uh, uh, that's a very good question. And the answer is no. Um, if you look back to the uh, very early periods in that Precambrian era, um, there were fewer and fewer continents down to potentially none at the beginning. Uh, continents are created by that volcanic activity along the, the, uh, the plate margins. Um, so that gradually creates more continent and less ocean. Like a scum being formed on top, really. It is, yes. <laughs> then we're not terribly sure when the water came on Earth, are we? Uh, no, or where, it, where came, it came from, or, or where it came from, um, but it must have arrived some 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 when between the uh, about four thousand and about three thousand eight hundred uh, million years ago, because the creatures were living in the water and there were obvious sedimentary rocks at uh, three point eight giga years ago, and at four giga years ago it would have been molten. So there's a period of about 200 million years. Um, and that's also a period of time when there would have been a lot of comets falling in, but we can't quite make all of the sums add up. If you look at things like the proportion of heavy water within the Earth's uh, oceans versus the heavy water content of um, comets, it doesn't add up at the moment yeah but thank don't you don't they reckon some of them may have come from asteroids as well because the proportions are a bit better in those yeah yeah they, they've got quite a lot of water in them mm. as well so it could well be from there any other questions for paul no there's a couple in the chat um well, I haven't got that open. If you want to read them out, Dave. It's not like the temperature was time was stable for us. Sorry, say again. Um, trying to work it out. If even if there's more carbon back then, it's not like the temperature that time was stable for us. If there's more carbon, would it be darker? It's carbon dioxide. I'm talking about really. Yeah, calm dioxide. Um, but um, yeah, you have to factor in the the you know, you, when you when you first hear that there was a thousand times as much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere just our, uh, uh, to break us out of the snowball, you think, crikey, that must have produced an enormous greenhouse effect. And of course, it did, but it was against a backdrop of a cold, cooler sun. Yeah. And you have to take that into account as well. And it's the, the, the changing in the heat output of the sun that is often um, ignored by, uh, you know, when people are sort of uh, just taking a, a simplistic view of it. Um, John mentioned about the moons further out um, warming up, not having enough mass or magnetic field. So the uh, water, any water there will be blown away by the solar wind potentially yeah but do i hear you right when you said that when the magnetic flip had patterns there's a period of time when we lose our magnetic shield as it were from the sun yes that's right andy so it drops we quite could field. quite soon head for a major extinction event then that's quite bad if it happens yeah 
there's yet another way in which the planet is out to get you. Yeah. Yeah. More than factor 50 then. Yeah. yeah. Okay, any other questions for Paul? Is he a factor of albedo effect? Because if you've got, if you've got more um, ice on the planet and then it versus a situation where you haven't got much ice on the planet. So that, that's really quite tricky, isn't it? Because, and also chopping down trees is a, is a, is a, must be a, have an effect. So that's what's happening now, isn't it? Yeah. The ice is melting. You don't know what's, <laughs> you don't know climate change, if, which, if it's real or not, do you really? It's just all up in the air. It's real. Well, I think it's real, um, and I think we do know enough about being able to do all the calculations. What I'm trying to show is it's complicated, um, and that um, we've, we've seen in my lifetime we've quadrupled the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere whilst keeping everything else more or less the same, um, and that is a bad thing and is going to cause the planet to get hotter. And we're finally it's undeniable that it's happening right now. You know, we, we're seeing those higher temperatures. They, they are obvious and around us. You know, forest fires in California are much more common. Hurricanes are more common and, uh, and worse when they occur. All of those things, those were the predictions that on average these things would happen and they are happening. And we've got two you say over the next few days, so. But would you say we're accelerating the inevitable anyway? Whether we do reduce our carbon emissions back to zero effectively, this, this is going to happen no matter what. It's going to happen no matter what. It's just, would you like it to happen by the end <laughs> of this century? Or would you like another 10,000 years? Well, I don't think it really matters to me, 10,000 years, but my children and my children's children, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or, an, or another 500 million years. If, if you're going to include jumping ship and going to Mars. I think that's probably the biggest problem is what I just said. A, it doesn't matter to me. And I think a lot of people who are in business or in commercial uh, are, you know, are, 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 are that minded. Yeah, I'm afraid so. Mm. And we seem to be winning the argument with electric cars a little bit. So, well, I so that's only a small step. Yeah. A little. It's what you do with all the batteries. Well, this is the other thing. Is it just are we making another problem? Yeah, you do make another problem, but yeah, you've got to do something now, haven't you? How much energy is well in, in how much energy do you use to buy, to build a battery? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, brilliant. interesting. Thanks for a really thought-provoking talk. Really interesting. So I've learned a lot again, which is fantastic. Thanks to everybody for coming in tonight and uh, what a great turnout thank you very much and uh, see you all again so before we go you know what i'm gonna say keep safe yeah. keep well and keep looking keep up looking up see you roger see you bye see everybody bye. Bye. Bye.